Uh, good morning. This is Alex Bryant. Uh, welcome to the October 26th webinar here on at East West about relocating, expanding operations, supply chain from China to Vietnam and Thailand. Uh, we've got a lot of people signed up for this webinar, um, and we've actually got a lot of questions already teed up for this. Um, so we're going to kind of jump right into it to manage time. We are lucky today to have two really knowledgeable speakers about Thailand and Vietnam and um, and have Mark Plum, who is very knowledgeable in both, uh, both uh, countries. I want to do a couple of housekeeping comments first. Uh, number one, um, you all are encouraged to ask questions throughout this whole webinar. Um, you need to, if you if your control panel is collapsed um, and the arrow, orange arrow is facing left, you, you press it and it'll open up and then there's a section there to ask questions. Just type us questions, we'll get them and then we'll turn around and uh, ask the speakers here that we have. So we're going to have just a brief introduction of East West. Brief introduction of the corporate speakers, brief introduction about the economic challenges of, of China, and then we're going to get right into the Q&A session, which will last, uh, that's going to be Q&A session about 45, 50 minutes around Thailand and Vietnam. Okay. So first, uh, just a brief introduction on East West. East West, we, we started the company in 2005, uh, where we focus on a consulting implementation firm. We focus on operational issues, supply chain issues, risk management issues. We operate in China, Southeast Asia, Mexico, and Central Eastern Europe. The team that we have all have really one qualification, and they had to have run a Western multinational on the ground in the four regions where we operate. And the executives we pulled from have been from Briggs & Stratton, Vector Corporation, Little Views, Eastman Kodak, Ashland, chemical, as well as uh, multiple other facilities, multiple other companies. But all the people we have had P&L facilities, responsibilities for running that company on the ground um, in our regions. So uh, geographically, we've obviously got the U.S. talked about, we've got China, we've got Mexico, we've got Central Eastern Europe, and we're in Southeast Asia. All right, uh, next I'd like to introduce the corporate speakers. That's a pretty impressive group. We've got three of them. Um, first of all, I'd ask Ben if you wouldn't mind giving a background on yourself. Um, ben is currently in Thailand, and Ben, if you would uh, take a, a brief moment and explain your background. Yeah, sure. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Alex. Uh, good day, everyone. So, um, yeah, my name is Ben Dobbs. I'm currently the Managing Director for Asia Pacific uh, Alliance Laundry Systems. Uh, quickly, Lance Laundry Systems are an industrial laundry manufacturer based out of uh, Ripon in Wisconsin, um, over a hundred year old uh, manufacturing company uh, focused in that um, unique sector of industrial laundry equipment um, and, and the leader in that market. My background, how I've ended up living in Thailand, uh, I've worked in my past uh, British or UK originally. Um, Moved fairly early, uh, worked in the U.S. Uh, for a company, uh, Parker Hannafin, and uh, worked with them. Moved into Thailand uh, about 15 years ago, where I uh, started to my my experience with setting up manufacturing facilities. Um, I've also worked in the region uh, in both uh, Malaysia and Vietnam uh, in markets uh, varying from uh, automotive. Uh, to food manufacturing, steel, uh, and currently with Alliance in uh, industrial laundry equipment. That's great. Thanks very much, Ben. Um, you're also co-chair of the AmCham Manufacturing Committee. Um, for well, I am. Uh, hasten, hasten to forget that, Alex. Yes, apologies. <laughs> um, Jacob, well, next, uh, you would explain your background as well. Jacob is, is currently calling in from uh, Vietnam. Hi, Jacob. I'm, I'm here in uh, Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam, in the south of Vietnam. I've been here uh, part-time since 2019 and full-time since COVID started. Um, I originally started out, I, I'm from the U.S. I started out uh, my international career in Mexico, um, working first in technology transfer, and then I worked in uh, manufacturing, uh, consulting with companies that were doing turnarounds and different things and then uh, supply chain things with building uh, purchasing organizations. Um, after that, I, I moved on to China, uh, spent 
I actually spent nine years in Mexico, spent uh, 14 years in China in the end. Um, in China, I did things uh, setting up operations, greenfield, uh, brownfield, um, and then also consulting to a number of uh, large companies on their supply chain strategy, their purchasing strategy, um, the localization strategy within China. Uh, worked for GE and Honeywell um, in their Honeywell in their aerospace division and the GE in their gas uh, division. And uh, and uh, during my time in China, I I did consulting work all throughout Asia, uh, Thailand, set up factories in Thailand, set up factories and did uh, reorganizations in Indonesia and in Vietnam, did lots of projects uh, also within Vietnam uh, during my time in China, and then uh, decided to come here uh, as more companies were looking at their one plus strategy and um, to have a straight route between two different countries. Excellent. Thank, Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Mark, if you would provide your background. Please. Sure. Th thanks, Alex, and uh, welcome to, to the attendees. Yeah, I'm, my name is Mark Plum. I go back to almost 1988 in Thailand, so I'm a little bit of the historian here. I was managing director uh, in, uh, of, of train air conditioning, a division of American Standard, and set up the train air conditioning manufacturing facility in, in, the, in the complete business for Indochina, and then subsequently went up to, went up to China in 94, and pretty much stayed there until 2014 and moving over uh, in around 2000 i became president of a company called briggs and stratton where i had them uh, uh for asia uh, based out of shanghai and i had six to seven manufacturing facilities from from japan to china to philippines to vietnam so so i've been i've been doing business in, in pretty much my whole business career in in asia and, and as I said, having specifically lived in both Thailand for a long time and uh, in China. So, um, and uh, and then now I've been with Alex since 20, 2014, I believe, 2014 or 2015. So that's a little bit of my background. Great. Thanks so much, Mark. Sure. Um, okay. So let's uh, briefly take a look at, uh, before we dive right into it, just the current challenges of, of what is driving this diversification from China. We're not going to spend a whole lot of time on this because I think people are pretty comfortable and pretty current on what the scenarios are, but just to make sure there's a level playing field among all the registrants, we're just going to provide a brief discussion on this. So this sure. is really about uh, we'll turn this over to Mark and just kind yeah. of review this. Sure. For for a, a lot of us who uh, really got going into China in the early mid '90s and then up until subsequently, we all we all have we've all have kind of a similar background of what what how it all started. And I, I, I'll go through this really quickly, but pretty much what happened is we were all looking for uh, inexpensive labor in a large domestic market, and uh, so that's why we went there. Uh, but now, what's what's happened you know, over the last 10, 12 years? Well, the, that that advantage has been uh, minimized to some degree with 10% labor increases um, mandated by the government for roughly the last 10 years. So that was the first thing that's kind of changed from when we went when we all went there years ago. Uh, next bullet, please, Alex. There we go. And then, as as I was saying, the, uh, the 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 labor costs, and then and then of course, as China became a little bit more sophisticated and got more involved in WTO, uh, some of the regulatory things that were were a little lax early on became a little more a little more difficult, and some of them actually became a little more difficult on domestic companies, and not the not the foreign companies. And then what happened as we as we talked a little bit about we after five or ten years, we we taught the Chinese. A, a lot about building appliances and air conditioning and and uh, automobiles and things of that nature. So then they all started, you know, with uh, with some of their own domestic companies for for competition that we didn't have ten years prior to that. Uh, next slide, please. And then uh, and then of course recently in the last uh, with a she year and now which is going on its ninth year, uh, a little bit more of a of a domestic uh, China 2025 by China initiative. So. That's put more pressure on, and then and then of course three or four years ago now with the with the tariffs, if you were bringing your products back in, either components or or finished goods back in the states, you had 20-25% uh, tariff, which was which was fairly problematic. Um, next slide, please, Alex. And then of course COVID now, and what's happened with COVID, and and as of again just talking this morning with a few of my old associates, 
it, it's it's really restricted travel within China, so you can't see your suppliers. Your suppliers can't see you. You can't, from the states, go to China to oversee things. And in many cases, some of our clients haven't been to see their operations in China for close to three years. So really, very problematic. And uh, of course, and then what's happened with the supply chains and the COVID and the factory shut down is long lead times and, and increasing shipping costs and. That just uh, that's just the last wrinkle that has really made, you know, made China not as attractive as it was t when we all went there 20, 25, 15 years ago. And uh, in, in essence, that's why a lot of people are looking at a China plus one, meaning we're not necessarily necessarily leaving China, but you may want to want to minimize your footprint to some degree as things become more could become more uh, more difficult in the future and particularly now after we have uh, with it there will not be a change of government for another five years so anyway that's kind of the, I, that's kind of the, the, the kind of the history lesson of what's happened in China over the last 25 years uh, next slide out time all right so we're now kind of jumping to the Q&A session I see we just got a big dump of people jumping in on the last uh, three or four minutes so just wanted to make sure uh, bringing one up speed. If you want to ask questions, we encourage questions the whole way through. We got a bunch of questions in the last couple of days. If you'd like to ask questions, we encourage you to do it. We're taking questions the whole way through. All you've got to do is if your control panel, you'll see questions, type the questions in. If your control panel is collapsed and the orange area there is facing left, just press that and it'll expand and you can ask the questions. Um, after the webinar, we will be sending everyone a recording uh, on the, the audio and video of this presentation. So you will see that as well. All right, so as we jump into the Q&A session, um, I want to kind of, you've got an awful lot of questions, and we'll kind of jump into these questions. Uh, I thought the way initially to kind of start is kind of a little higher level, and then we drill down. We've got a lot of industry sectors represented on this phone call today. So we will try to get to the questions and relate, relatable to those industry sectors. Um, if we have any questions we don't get to, we will then follow you within the week after this. Um, why don't I just start? And Mark, you, you, you've you lived in Southeast Asia. You run manufacturing plants. You run supply chain operations from the 1990s until now, right? And, and mm -hmm. we all know that Vietnam, Thailand are attracting a lot of interest from U.S. companies who are diversifying beyond China. Can have been on the ground in Vietnam and Thailand for this long. Can you talk about kind of just to provide a brief insight in what are making what is kind of significant about these countries and what's their significance now, particularly this sure. moment? Sure. Yeah, let me just and I'll go through this briefly and then Ben and, and Jacob can really get into the details. So having been in been in Thailand in the early 90s, actually 1990, uh, I, I've been kind of saying it's kind of a uh, that that uh, Thailand was China before China was was China. Meaning all the, the uh, all USA, Japanese, Korean, all German companies uh, were active in in Thailand, very active back in the early 90s. Companies like Whirlpool, Bosch, Carrier, Train, Toshiba, Lucky Gold Star, AMD, Intel. So, for those who haven't had an opportunity to really get a good look at Thailand, uh, it it uh, it's it's got a deep and deep and broad supply base for and 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 that's the reason many of these companies. And then of course, subsequently, what happened in in 96 97 as labor became much much more inexpensive in china a lot of a lot of them set up operations in china but they didn't close their operations in thailand there those footprints are still there and very strong and and, and then of course then what happened is as it, and then uh, vietnam as they came out of you know the whole the whole uh, scenario within states and we had the embargo they started really attracting, you know, more labor-intensive products and and, and and services, and now subsequently they are, are moving up the value value chain. And of course, Jacob will talk a lot about that. So, uh, for those who haven't been, who those have been focused on China for the last 20, 25 years, and haven't had a chance to really look at, at Thailand and Vietnam, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised at how sophisticated the business is, the manufacturing, and the supply base is in those areas. Hey Mark, you had, I know you were based out of Thailand at operations there and you had in, in, in Vietnam, you had, uh, I think a distribution operation. Yeah, there. no, I, yeah, I had, so I had, of course, distribution. Once the embargo was lifted by President Clinton in, uh, I think, 93 or 94, we set up a rep office right away. And then we established, and I established down south of uh, of Kamau, down down the Mekong, 
we made we with Briggs and Stratton we made engines for the long tail the long tail industry down there. So we had a we had a component uh, an assembly operation down in Kamal. So and uh, it was you know quite interesting that as there was no roads so everything was water traffic and water taxis and our <laughs> engines were the were the uh, were the were the main pe way people got around in South Vietnam in the early years. Uh, so we got uh, so Ben, you, you've been operating. You've operated in Vietnam. You've operated in Thailand for a long time. Can you kind of set the stage? We drilling into the, in both Thailand and Vietnam. Kind of set the stage for Thailand. Talk a little bit about the strength of the economy, inflation, economic trends you're seeing on the ground in Thailand now. Yeah, sure. So I, I mean, Mark touched on it within Thailand. Manufacturing um, it, it, it is and has been a big driver in 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 the Thailand economy uh for a long time now i think certainly the last 25 years the automotive industry has really took a really took a foothold uh and, and obviously is a big driver so export uh manufacturing and export is a huge part of uh, of the economy here and as we look at you know the covid years in the last few years uh and how thailand has been able to cope somewhat with you know the other part of the uh, of the thai economy the the hotel tourism sector that obviously was murdered by by that whole situation, you know, the manufacturing sector kept reasonably strong, and uh, and and as a result, you know, it kind of shows where those two areas really drive the economy. And we look at, you know, for example, export growth in Thailand still running at 20%. Uh, forecasting slow down a little bit over over the next year or so, but companies still coming in, uh, uh, U.S. companies, uh, Chinese companies, uh, certainly. Uh, you know, helping uh, setting up, you know, setting up factories, taking taking Thailand as a as a uh, as a as a location is happening, and that's helping driving um, you know the economy and export growth. Inflation in Thailand is is you know at about four uh, percent uh, GDP this year, about three and a half. So you're seeing a little bit of an upside down, and then forecast to to switch that back around over the next year. I think 23, they're looking at. Four and a half to five percent on on the GDP and inflation uh, with any luck, although no one can predict that. Uh, if I could, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. Uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, at least moving that that needle um, back the right way. Um, yeah, that's that's probably you know the the, the highlights um, yeah. that I I, I would put out there. That's perfect. That's perfect, Ben. Uh, Jacob, kind of same question to you around just setting the stage for the audience around Vietnam, strength the economy, the inflation situation, economic trends as has been talked about Thailand. Yeah, um, I mean, Vietnam has been very strong in the last couple of years. I mean, it's been kind of the new one that people have been focusing on uh, for a alternative to China or the, the one plus for your China. Um, this year, the growth has been quite impressive. Um, they were targeting at the beginning of the year 7% growth. Um, now, because of the last quarter, we were at like 13% growth. So now they're figuring that by the end of the year, it's going to be 8% growth for Vietnam. Um, so that's, uh, as far as I understand, that's the top in Asia, at least. Um, so that's that's one thing. Uh, the inflation, about the same as Thailand. I've seen 3.5-ish percent. Um, but, uh, you know, some of the things with the, the, uh, the transportation costs starting to go down, it's starting to make people feel hopeful that, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it won't be so bad, um, because of that, um, with the economic trends, um, this is a lot of, a lot of different things, especially, um, a lot of industries that have, uh, started to come in. Um, there's been huge investments in the, the paper and, uh, packaging industry. Uh, there's huge investments in uh, electronics assembly, and it's been growing really like crazy in the electronics assembly. Uh, people are quite desperate to get out of China in that area, and then they're they're quite uh, hopeful to do the second and second tier suppliers starting to get in to support those industries, so they can support it more without imp so many imported parts. And um, and uh, yeah, and it's been attracting a lot of uh, U.S. companies especially U.S. companies that uh, want to distribute to uh, other people within Asia and uh, support, support other factories within Asia. Right, right, excellent. Thank you both for that. And um, as we're looking at these two countries, we're getting ready to get into supply chain. 
questions, but I, there have, has been a question here that popped up around uh, trade agreements. And this is from someone who wrote about the fact that the tariffs in China kind of came pretty quickly. They were put on by an administration. Can you all kind of talk about what's the trade agreement situation for, for Ben? We'll start with you about Thailand and then Jacob, if you would cover that for Vietnam. Yeah, so I mean, if we talk specifically uh, Thailand uh, and the US, as an uh, extremely, Mark will probably, uh, and feel free to correct me, but uh, at any time, uh, but Mark certainly has a no lot of knowledge and will add to this as well. Uh, a very long history between Thailand and uh, and the US, Treaty of Amity um, is, is, is a structure that uh, manages, controls, and holds uh, duty exemptions and trade back from Thailand to the US. Um, it's a security blanket, it, it really is. It certainly helps with the, the attraction uh, for, for the business and it's a relationship that I, that I think has, has value. But, but more than that as well, you know, it, it, it separates being a US uh, company from, from other companies as well, coming into Thailand just simply because of the ability to, to be a major shareholder uh, when you set up a company in Thailand um rules in 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 the thai kingdom you know stipulate uh thai ownership uh inability to own land uh and things like that uh, making things a little more challenging for other companies obviously there are ways around that and there's all sorts of incentive programs that uh, manage and drive it but the treaty of amity keeps things very very simple and clear for us based companies to be able to set up in thailand um so two parts to it as i said uh, one you know the trade uh exemptions and duties uh, and to uh, you know the business relationship and the, the ability to, to to manage, set up, start, uh, and run businesses as an American-owned uh, company. That's great, Ben. Thanks so much. Jacob, I would turn the same kind of question to you that the, this registrant asked. Yeah, um, Vietnam has had less focus on specifically the U.S., but has had a ton of focus on building uh, trade agreements and and relations throughout the world. Um, they have basically the most number of trade agreements that you can trade with everywhere in the world or most places in the world without any tariffs or any major problems. Um, so that becomes a big advantage for, for Vietnam, especially for companies that are looking to look at more than one market or more than one country that they need to support. Excellent. Okay. Isn't there close, like, I think you mentioned close to 150 bilateral trade agreements with Vietnam and other countries? Yeah, well, there's 15 agreements, but it covers, it covers a, a lot of countries that you wouldn't expect. Yeah. I mean, you can, yeah. you can go into Mexico, you can go into Peru, you can go into mm. uh, Malaysia. I mean, mm. it, it just covers yeah. almost everywhere. I mean, yeah. you know, there's new agreements with Europe that you can get everything into Europe. Uh, with reducing tariffs in the next uh, three years, just started. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then real quick, with Ben was talking about people don't the the history of the Treaty of Amity. It actually goes back to Teddy Roosevelt and 150 years ago. So it, there's a strong, strong bond between the two countries. You're, you're not that old, Mark. You can't remember. No, that. I'm, <laughs> I, I, I'm back with chewing and the guys and lek pai. <laughs> we just had a question pop up uh, for Vietnam and Thailand. It talks about capital equipment manufacturing. All right. It says, is there commodity parts available locally in both Thailand and Vietnam, specifically parts like electrical circuit uh, breakers, relays, uh, mechanical parts like bearing shaft materials? Is it easier to import this in from China or do Thailand and Vietnam have those have uh, local electronics uh, for uh, for this capital equipment? Uh, so yeah. Ben, yeah. Sure, Alex. Yeah, I'll jump in. Um, yes, uh, easiest question to answer. Uh, easy way to answer the question. So all of the, you know, in in our factory, uh, the stamping presses we have were built locally. Uh, automation equipment, a lot of um, automation uh, suppliers, robot integrators in Thailand. Um, most of the equipment, uh, assembly equipment, um, test equipment, uh, is all done locally for you know within Thailand. Uh, for for the facility, obviously there's a, a maybe a flip on if you're doing a transition business or or looking to start up and and bringing in equipment from uh, overseas countries, then that that's possibly the way you do it. That's where we've done it in the past when we've set up factories. I've been involved in, um, but but once you really get your feet on the ground and you look at it from a perspective of of local ability, 
uh, you know, it's it's all here in in Thailand. Excellent. Yeah. And in Viet in Vietnam, there's also a lot of availability, but um, a lot of it is via distributors in other countries, uh, from other con countries. Um, so it's it's less mature than Thailand would be. Um, a lot of companies, especially if they're coming from China, they they rely on their uh, Chinese suppliers until they can w work out a localization strategy. Especially at the early stages of COVID, I had tons and tons of companies that that's what they were concerned about. They had Vietnamese suppliers and they didn't realize that their Vietnamese suppliers were so reliant on Chinese suppliers. So then they were looking at um, how can we localize this or can we source from Thailand? Can we source it from India? Can we get it from somewhere else where there's a free trade agreement and we can get the parts in we need and we have an alternative if there's an issue in China? Excellent. Well, we'll kind of, that kind of leads us into our, our discussion around um, around supply chain. Um, ben, you, you, you're you obviously uh, running a facility there in, in Thailand right now. You've worked in Thailand and Vietnam. Talk about, let's talk about the local component, raw material availability. And then obviously, de depending on the sector, right, depends on the, each sector's got their own specific uh, uniqueness to it. But as running that facility, can you talk about the ability to identify and qualify key suppliers in your facility? Have you had issues of that trouble identifying suppliers or is it easy to localize, find local suppliers for the facility? Apologies, I forgot to unmute. Uh, yeah, I mean, um, I think Thailand's in a, 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 in a strong position now, as I say, if we look at the supply chain and you, 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 you kind of put it into buckets of markets. So when we think about the automotive industry, so within what I build, you know, a, a, an industrial laundry uh, machine is not that uh, different, you know, to a car in regards to its, uh, uh, you know, a, a steel frame surrounded by sheet metal formed and uh, elect electrical components, a motor and a drive shaft, right? So, I mean, keeping things down to basics, you can find markets that have supply chains that qualify for what you might need, um, right? You know, electrical uh, manufacturing uh, or, or, you know, Thailand's, Thailand's got some really big sectors that, that are driving. If we look at uh, automotive being the number one, uh, hard drive manufacturing, aerospace sectors growing big uh, in, in Thailand, uh, food, food manufacturing, pharma is very big. So within all of those kind of uh, manufacturing sectors, you can find supply chain expertise there, there is a lot of, of supply chain uh, and there's areas of, of very large industrial manufacturing uh, capability. They're very cent they're centered, kind of similar to Vietnam in, in, in a lot of ways. So they're centered in certain areas, but, but huge. Um, and, and, and as a result, you tend to see the supply chain uh, is right there in the area. And, and also what's happened with the automotive industry in Thailand is that the big automotive manufacturers will bring the supply chain with them uh a lot of times okay so they they may uh not necessarily have local be look have been looking for local manuf uh, local uh, uh, supply chain or manufacturing companies uh so and if they if if nothing was available they would bring them with them as well so that then brings capability uh and talent but but everything you know from from stamping to fabrication um you know we we find a, a, a huge amount of of capability uh you know capacity can be and has been challenges in the past couple of years with manufacturing being uh fairly busy in this region uh but you can always find more we don't have an issue um i mean i, I for example we we now i think we've been in manufacturing for four years with alliance in the plant and we're about 80 percent localized on uh, the number of components for for both the products we build, so it's it's fairly uh, within your reach. Yeah. And and while while you were talking, we had a question pop up on, on Thailand and Vietnam. I'll just ask it, then Ben, and then. But it was talking about Thailand. Is, is there for raw material sources such as uh, for steel, for example, structural steel, steel mills? Are there those raw materials in in Thailand? Yeah, and 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 so the Thailand may not be the origin if we if we talk about steel specifically, but um, so most of the steel that I use will, will comes from uh, POSCO, uh, so they're they're bringing it in from 
uh, Korea. Uh, and they have then, uh, um, um, what's the, the, the rolling shops, they'll have the steel shops. So they'll bring yeah. in coils, giant coils, and then they'll process it. There's, there, there's no steel furnace in Thailand. I think in Vietnam, uh, there's uh, Formosa, is it? I can't remember. Yeah. The, the steel guys there but yep. you know and again they're, they're yeah they're cranking up so vit so and they they looked at vietnam as being a real base and they've got a huge tonnage that that and that that's nothing but beneficial for southeast asia as far as a price uh price price perspective but japan's uh korea they're the areas you get it from you, you just deal with the, the the direct uh local uh local uh representatives and and these guys are you know so we de we deal with posco we don't deal with it's not through agents or distribution um so it, so it's a pretty uh safe uh route yes yeah, so you're dealing directly with the firm but in, in yeah Thailand. okay so yeah. so the same kind of question jacob thank you ben and jacob same kind of question to you can you talk about you're doing a lot of spot chain work on the ground in vietnam right you've been doing it you talk a little bit about the challenge of identifying suppliers, qualifying suppliers in Vietnam. Um, yeah, um, there, there's a there's a, a lot of suppliers in a lot of areas. Um, if you happen to be in one of the stronger areas, then you're going to have a lot more options. And then, kind of when you get into the suppliers, there's you kind of get into tiers. You'd get into tiers of maybe you have a European supplier that has a factory that would be very similar to what you would see in Europe or the U.S. Um, and then you get into some larger local suppliers and then you get into kind of companies that are just mom and pop type companies that they're just doing some little component or little thing and they can do that and they can do it to maybe a local standard and then there's different price levels for each of those and the big one is you know depending on who you are like if you're like Ben and you're buying a lot of steel and you can get that you know direct then they're in a good position if you're a smaller guy, they're going to deal with the distributors and they're going to have, you know, less less control over whether they use the, the Japanese steel or the Korean steel. But, I mean, they can get something that's suitable and it is a little bit more challenging for them if you have some reason that you need a specific one. But it's never really a big issue to get it. It's just a, a little bit more trouble for the supplier. Yeah, and, and, and let me ask you all specifically kind of just kind of on on the on the webinar today, we've got um, so many different industry sectors represented: automotive, electronics, um, injection molding, so many. But but just talking a little bit about, say, the electronic sector, Jacob, in in, in Thailand. Yeah, talk a little bit about that and the expansion of that, or the and then the PCB boards, and talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Yeah, in, in in Vietnam, in the last year or so, last two years really, the the electronics has been moving to to Vietnam like crazy, and because they and they've been mostly moving to some areas, uh, they are, to the Haiphong area because it's only 12 hour trip from um, from Shenzhen. So then you can get your parts basically overnight, assemble them the next day. Um, that's a huge advantage for that area. But then there's a lot of electronics facilities that are closer to Hanoi that are a bit farther away. There's also a lot of facilities down here in the south, um, which is uh, Ho Chi Minh City. Um, and because of this push for the electronics assembly and all the issues that they've had in China recently, now it's more the push of the second tier suppliers that they need to support these factories locally. Um, before a lot of these companies, Foxconn, Jabo, all these would say, eh, we don't mind. You can, you can produce your, your part in uh, China and just ship it into, into Vietnam. It's no big deal. But with all these disruptions and everything else, now these companies are more pushing their second tier suppliers to say hey you need to be closer to the factories and you need to be able to supply us more locally so that's a that's a big new push that's coming in uh, and and that's also really building the capacity in that area and that's just you know talking about really what's happening in electronics and, and just huge growth that's happened in the last year or two in in vietnam that's pretty significant and i think uh Ben, you're obviously you've got the electronics in Thailand, you've got the automotive in Thailand, you've got the injection molding. Can you talk a little bit about where you were, were on the plastic, on the electronic side and the in the automotive side? Uh, 
Well, I mean, in Thailand from um, electronic manufacturing has, has focused predominantly on, on hard drive manufacturing. Uh, Western Digital and Seagate have a huge uh, presence in Thailand. Uh, I think, uh, as we discussed earlier, I think it's now the number one producer in the world of hard drives is, is Thailand, just, just through those two companies. Uh, so, so that brings, a, you know, a, along with it, the supply chain requirement and the support. Um, but, but they're giants, you know, they're, they're, they're big, huge, almost the, uh, similar to the Foxconn type size companies. Um, and, you know, if we look at automotive, we, I've mentioned that, touched on it. Automotive is, is, is huge. Um, the nickname in Thailand of several years ago, they used to call one of the industrial estates where uh, I think it was where General Motors set up, who, who have now left Thailand, but uh, they called it the Detroit of the East. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, automotive, very strong. If we're talking about supply chain components, especially plastics, injection molding and uh, die casting, that kind of thing, uh, that that comes with uh, with those markets being so strong, especially the automotive. So uh, again, we haven't had any issues localizing those type of things, the injection molding capability, tool building, all done locally, no reasons to build a tool back in uh, the US and ship it to Thailand, all of that capability yeah. is all here. Excellent. Let's uh, turn our attention real quick. We've got a bunch of questions that came in and to turn our attention to labor, a little labor availability, uh, skilled, semi-skilled labor, uh, labor rates, labor inflation. Um, so Ben, you, you run the operation in Thailand. Can you talk a little bit about the difficulty of finding, was it difficult to find the employees that were there with the, the labor rates for employees and, and really the labor inflation? Cause that's kind of a, we're seeing that obviously here in the U S how is that affecting uh, what's going on on the ground in Thailand? Yeah. So, so let me start with the availability and skilled workers. And again, I hate to sound like a broken record, but when, when we talk about that automotive sector, that 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 brought a huge amount of training. Uh, we're we're talking three generations now, so we've got when it, you could just touch on engineering, for example. So now, you know, you, you you've got a very uh, established graduate um, uh, uh, engineering uh, incumbent uh, sector where you, you you're getting fairly skilled young engineers, um, then then experienced engineers up to twenty plus years. Uh, no issues within that area. The blue collar workforce is, is, is huge. Obviously you could be out in uh, a non-industrialized area and then you would have challenges. Uh, but uh, I think the, the easiest way to point that, uh, to, to point to this is when we set up the Alliance plant, we held a hiring day for the blue collars. We hired 140 people in one day, right? So, you know, it's, it's, it's there, the skilled labor's there. They're all used to manufacturing. So you don't need to train these guys how to, or, and girls, how to uh, use torque drivers or, uh, you know, do inspection, because they're all coming from manufacturing. Very few people you would hire uh, would, would be blue. Very, uh, you know, very few of them. And, and a lot of the, the blue collar workforce is actually, you know, fairly, uh, fairly qualified, technical schools, um, technical qualifications, a lot of welding capability. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's surprise it's surprisingly uh, easy. And 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 if any and truly, if 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 somebody's finding that part of it hard, it's it's uh, it, it's unimaginable. unimaginable. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And can you talk a little bit about like on the inflation rates you're seeing? The for rates, yeah. So so the rates, so the labor rates. So what you're talking about it's it's a 300, 350 to 350 Thai baht a day uh, minimum wage yeah, in Thailand. Uh, yeah. There is a there is a there is a rate um, uh, adjustment depending on where you are. The further north you go, where, wherever wherever the government is trying to incentivize manufacturing to go, they'll adjust the rate a little cheaper so you can drive it down. But you know when you take the rate into consideration and the average overall take home and salary from everybody, most most manufacturing companies are at or above the minimum salary. Uh, it doesn't really impact you because kind of the market is setting that rate. The average blue collar workforce will take home about 24,000 Thai baht uh, per month. Okay, so that's above that rate anyway. Uh, that's that's all in, right? So that's that's not just the hours. That that includes all of the 
your uh, um, allowances, et cetera, et cetera. But you can always use that 22, 23, 24,000 as a, as a rough nut figure. And that hasn't changed dramatically in the 15 years that I've been here. So that, that hits the inflation point as well. That's the starting salary. A lot right. of companies, a lot of companies that will, will stick within that, but uh, inflation in manufacturing in Thailand pretty much consistently will be within two and a half to five percent and as a manufacturing company it's then down to how good a year you've had so it's within your own control five percent is the norm is, is really the norm it sounds silly because that's the high end but you could say four to five percent and and that's very consistent year on year out there there, there isn't any real difference uh, every year we go into the market uh you know kind of uh, rate presentations uh, from the various HR companies out there who, who who do that and advise on it, and and it's always the same. Interesting, but and that's one of the benefits of Thailand, certainly on that. Jacob, well, it's predictable, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what you're getting every year. Jacob, can you discuss Thailand? The same scenario for for, for Vietnam on the on the labor the yeah, availability it's, of it. It's a uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit different here. Um, you know, low skilled labor um, is quite available in most places and most things. Um, as you get into like um, highly skilled machine operators or people that can program the machines, um, sometimes you get into big shortages because there's so many companies moving in. And then the other rate the other issue can be is if you're in a certain industry and you're in the center between a bunch of companies within your industry. Um, and your your employees have a lot of options. Um, so then it's a problem to sometimes identify a key person, you know, not your average guy, but your key person. Uh, that guy's sometimes hard to, to get. And then it's also the thing of um, retaining them um, and incentive structures and other things to be able to make sure that they stay with you. I know I've talked to a lot of factory owners and and that's a, a big thing that they're, they're always kind of worried about of, they're worried about their key guys and how do I retain my key guys and make sure they're happy. Uh, you know, the the other mid-level guys or junior guys or unskilled labor, um, they're not as worried about. There's there's more turnover there and and they can deal with it, but they can't deal with it when it's their key engineer or something like that. A fair point. And it, when you're seeing like labor inflation, I mean, like like Vietnam is kind of this country, they're kind of dictating down from top. Here's kind of the inflation yeah, sure. for the yeah, very similar to China, where it's kind of dictated from the top, um, but also similar to Thailand or Thailand and Vietnam. You know, the people that are skilled people are not getting minimum wage anyway, and uh, you yeah. know, even the junior people. Um, if you're an international factory and you're working on international standards and you're training them to do things that are a bit higher skilled, even if it's not skilled work, um, you're going to be paying over the minimum wage anyway. Yeah, fair, fair point. Hey, Ben, uh, you talking a little bit about the technical you know, training and stuff, don't like on some of the large industrial states, uh, you, you've got some of the satellite tech schools and programs going on, as, as I recall, and, you know, Amada or Hemorrhage in those large areas. So Thailand really takes that training pretty serious, don't they? Yeah, no skill that that all still exists. Uh, you know, in fact, I think there was a training program I sent half a dozen of my team to uh, with uh, with Hemorrhage. Uh, I, I mean, one thing that Thailand has really progressed well on is is the uh, is technical schools. Uh, so much more, you know, kind of like the old fashioned, um, you know, back in the day, uh, technical colleges uh, versus going to university, learning a trade. And, and Thailand's really pushing hard on that. And some of the bigger schools have technical colleges. We partner up with them um, and, and the universities as well. So a lot of our engineers are coming out of, uh, who have, in fact, we hired now, we, we're now in a position where we're hiring uh, guys who have done internships in, uh, in Alliance in, you know, a couple of years ago, they've now graduated and now you're hiring them. Um, so yeah, there's a, it's, it's a pretty decent structure, uh, the education system. Though not as uh, not as strong, I, I would suggest. I think that's just the reality. Um, but uh, but when it comes down to, like I mentioned, things like welding, or machine machine programming, real technical um, uh, kind of uh, kind of trades. Uh, yeah, Thailand's done a really good job last few years putting together that kind of uh, structure. Yeah, 
So, and, and there is, there's just, there's, there's a, there's a plethora of, as you say, training opportunities all over all the time. Good. And then of it's, course you have the advanced degrees out of, uh, out of Chulong corn and those guys is if you want to get. Yeah. Yeah. Engineers. Yeah. Yeah. So what most of our engineers come out of, uh, KMIT, right. King Mon cuts up in Bangkok. Yeah. That's, that's a great school. And, and in fact, we have a, with a partnership with them. Uh, as do a lot of as do a lot of multinational companies because because that's the place to go right yeah oh well, we've got a bunch of questions here about uh, manufacturing infrastructure um, availability of business of business parks uh, we've got uh, questions around can you find the land can you find available greenfield operations and we actually just got about six more questions so we'll hit this one first um, Ben we've obviously worked with you all on the, the sites like find the right sites in Thailand negotiate with the government etc getting the facility can you talk a little bit about the availability of business parks in thailand is it is the structure kind of the way you see in other parts of asia and china the, you've got the business parks you're working with the business parks to grow and and talk a little bit about the growth of thailand in in the rayong area uh, but ben you've got it on, on mute yeah I'm, I'm not a fast learner um <laughs> so we we talk about the uh we talk about the certainly. I mean, we talk about the Eastern Economic Corridor, as they now call it, which is the Rayong Chombri area, which is where I'm I'm working. Um, you know, it, it's huge. There's like two and a half thousand factories now in that area. I think Hemorrhage alone. So, Mark, you mentioned Hemorrhage uh, or WHA, as they now are. Uh, they have twelve uh, industrial estates on their own, uh, covering over twenty-seven thousand acres of land. So there is uh, not just uh, just just growing and growing and growing. I mean, um, it just keeps stretching out. So the land is available. The industrial parks keep getting uh, built. When one's full, they seem to just uh, prop another one up. There's three or four of the big um, uh, owners. Uh, Amada, as Mark mentioned, uh, Rojana, another one. Uh, and, and you know, between them all, uh, there is. Uh, uh, there is the uh, industrial parks all over. So when you mention like other industrial parks in the traditional sense, yes, they are. You know, there's an uh, entrance into the industrial park. There's a central, um, you know, feeding zone where there's banks and everything that's required for workers to to sustain a day to day life. Uh, and um, you know that that's very consistent in all of the parks. Um, Right. And they help you right. too. I mean, don't they help you too a little bit? You know, utility hookups, even to help yeah. you with, with business licenses and you know things things of that nature. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, again, it 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 benefits them to sell it to sell it in uh, in a package. The ease of setting yeah, up the business, sure. right? So, I mean, the, the infrastructure in in Thailand's uh, got gotten really good. There's no doubt. I mean, we talk about roads and highways. Um, the a huge amount of investment they've made. Uh, rail as well. Uh, they're building a new seaport up in Bangkok, so that'd be an additional seaport to to the Lam Shabang port, which is close by to the eastern zone where I am, and then Bangkok port, which is uh, obviously supporting the the main the main other manufacturing zone or Samut Prakan, which is uh, the other huge that that's a huge manufacturing zone. So those two seaports kind of uh, support that area as well as the um, the the air uh, the airlines or, or air support so yeah it's uh, infrastructures uh there and and fairly stable yeah we we, we did an event with her prize last year a year and a half ago about different sites in thailand so jacob when you're looking at thailand when you're looking at vietnam talk a little bit about the manufacturing infrastructure in vietnam as far as the same setup as far as the parks availability of the parks can you address that as well yeah yeah, there's there's quite a number of parks. I've, I've read e anywhere from 120 to 150 different parks, and there's like 30 new approved that haven't been built yet. And then that goes down to you know there's big parks, uh, you know, kind of more the the style that you'd expect in China. And then there's a lot of smaller parks too. Um, yeah. You know, mostly international companies would be more focusing on the larger parks or the mid-sized parks, um, unless you're you're truly going into a green field and you're buying huge amount of land or getting a huge amount of greenfield property. Um, yeah, there's a there's a ton of options and it really just depends on what you need. Um, there's there's uh, pre-built, uh, which is, you know, becoming more difficult. Um, and then, you know, there's time delays if you're if you're doing a build to suit or anything like that. 
and then yeah there's just a lot of options and then same thing um, especially if you're dealing with one of the bigger ones they're going to help you support because they want you to get your business license and get everything in order because they want you to be happy in their industrial park and uh, hire people and get business going through there yeah when you talk you talked about the there's there's some of the lease spaces that are out there the existing spaces the, those as I understand I mean the, those we know are, are moving a little move, moving pretty quickly is it harder to find those in this environment now yeah I mean there's it's, it's it's a little bit harder to find them right now and prices have been increasing because it's harder to find them right. um, so you know people are moving um, I, I see factories that um, that their their increases in uh, cost at the end of their five-year contract has been more than they expected and uh, mm -hmm. caused some problems for them so mm -hmm. it's something to have a good long-term strategy and it also you know it also depends on if you're in one of the bigger industrial parks they're going to have much more of an established system than if you're you're dealing with more of a local landlord that maybe doesn't have a, a very proper system and is not used to real, really working with a lot of international companies. 100% agree with that. And, and we, we saw that in the early days in China. We've seen that now in Vietnam, a little less so in Thailand, but certainly agree with that 100%. Um, I had a question, another question pop in here. It talks about uh, Thailand and, and, and Vietnam, uh, both trying to encourage regional headquarters to move to Thailand, move to Vietnam. Um, um, and it, the idea there is that a lot of these headquarters were up in China, right? They're trying to pull them in. Obviously, a lot of regional headquarters in Singapore, but they're trying to get them into Thailand and Vietnam. Um, have you all seen companies trying to bring in regional headquarters into Thailand or Vietnam? And obviously, from the governments, they're, they're, we know they're pushing that. Have you seen a lot of that um, in, in the recent year, too? That's I a very interesting Thailand would have you more activity in that area. Um, Vietnam has been not very strong in that area. Uh, major, maybe drawing in some major uh, manufacturing centers for large companies, but ha actually having a, uh, a regional headquarters, um, I, I don't see that much. Uh, I see most companies here are more, their regional headquarters would be in Singapore, uh, just because the tax advantage and just easier easier of doing business um, some people still use their regional headquarters in hong kong but i see a lot of them moving that towards singapore and it also makes yeah. it easier for your investments in uh in vietnam especially as an american company yeah yeah, yeah and, and Jake, jacob you're right i mean with thailand has uh uh, just restructured un under the Board of Investment, um, what they used to call the Regional Operating Headquarters scheme that was was designed to promote uh, uh, operating headquarters. Um, that was very much driven uh, to service the oil and gas industry, especially Shell, who, who were operating just huge contract labor forces in, uh, in, in Thailand. And it was a way for them to get around personal income tax uh, liability, basically. Um, so they've restructured that entire program uh, and renamed it the International Business Center program. And um, it, it's it's really attractive. There's a lot of companies now looking at it. It doesn't have, it's not a, uh, a an extremely um, stringent uh, mechanism on, on, on your operating headquarters when it comes to banking, financial, et cetera. What you, it's more of a service um uh, uh providing uh mechanism that they're wanting to promote so they want you to be servicing your regional uh, uh, uh offices or businesses manufacturing locations out of thailand yeah so yeah. In, in other words providing hr services providing uh trading services providing sales services sales and marketing services uh and having those centered in thailand and and those and then those other regional then facilities uh, back charging into Thailand for the for that service, right? So it's a revenue stream, uh, and the incentives to do that obviously tax related. Uh, there is income tax, uh, expat uh, benefits as well as uh, you know the other regular be uh, benefits for providing work permits and uh, and visas and long term stay situations as well. So it's it is it is pretty uh, well received. Uh, I'm not sure how. 
uh, you know, the government is is scoring it, but certainly there's there's. Uh, I have a colleague of mine or a friend of mine who who works at Ducati, and they've just done it. They they just opened an engine building plant, uh, and uh, and and they they've put that under the IBC, uh, and a lot of people, especially multinationals, are looking at it. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, see some, I see mostly companies that are Japanese and Korean doing this type of stuff in Vietnam, but it's not really because of the headquarters. It's just providing back, uh, back office services uh, at a lower rate because of the availability of Japanese speakers or Korean speakers at, at a lower rate. Right, right, in Vietnam, right. Uh, we, we had a uh, question pop up here, and it talks about can the panel speak on restrictions about relocating used to process, used process equipment from existing China operations into Thailand and into Vietnam? Can you, if you're moving, obviously you're relocating a facility, obviously like most countries, just talk about Thailand and Vietnam and what their restrictions they would have, if any, on used equipment. Yeah, I, I'll touch on, on, on Thailand quick, uh, Jacob. So, uh, again, uh, the board, the board of investment, which is your first stop uh, within Thailand when when you're looking to to set up manufacturing, or or is the second stop after contacting your industrial state. Um, they have very structured programs for this, so they allow uh, the there is a specific program for relocating a plan. So if you're relocating a whole line, you're you're picking that line up and bringing it into Thailand. Uh, they right. they have. Uh, Duty exemption for that equipment uh, up to certain, you know, I mean, a certain year of the equipment they're looking at. So they don't want you to bring 50 year old equipment into Thailand, uh, dilapidated equipment. They want it to be anywhere from five to 10 years, I believe, but don't quote me on that, uh, dependent on the type of equipment that it is. But it's, again, there is a program that is specifically structured to allow you to do it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Vietnam is, yeah, Vietnam is a is a different story because it's it's a bit difficult. Um, by theory, you're not supposed to bring in used equipment. They don't want you to. They want you to bring in new, up to date equipment. They don't want uh, to have uh, old Chinese equipment dumped in uh, Vietnam. However, yeah. in the last couple of years, there's a lot more companies doing um, remanufactured equipment and bringing that in, and they're getting some more flexibility. Um, and they're accepting a lot more equipment if it's in good condition and doesn't seem too bad. Uh, they, they're getting more accepting, um, but on the official level, um, they would prefer that you buy new equipment for the factory. So yeah, it's something yeah. to look at very, yeah, very I, closely if you're going to get into this. Yeah, and I, I think j just as a caveat in what I said, just in, important to be to be careful, uh, you know, kind of what I've said. Uh, that that program that's structured in Thailand is specifically about uh, attracting companies who want to move quickly, right? So if you're bringing, so you're shutting the factory down in China, and you want to move that line, then Thailand will help you do that. But if you're just looking to send old equipment, then you can't, right? So if you're building a new factory. And 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 you're you're expanding your manufacturing, you know that that's got to be new equipment. But but they 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 are obviously uh, relevant in regards to they understand what's going on in the global economy. They understand what's happening in China. There is a, a huge amount of Chinese manufacturing companies coming into Thailand, and so I think they just recognize that. And if you're uh, as I said looking to shut down and move into Thailand, uh, they're happy to help. Yeah. yeah. Just on real, real quick on that, I we've had pretty good we had very good experience in, in relations with with I say East West with BOI on in on several businesses in Thailand and I'm not saying better or worse than Vietnam, but certainly our experience with with BOI has been they they want to attract business and that's and they they understand that's that's the game being played and uh, so we're really a professional group. Yeah, and we we've done some webinars with them and worked with them when we moved yeah, some facilities, yeah, very, 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 facilities yeah. uh, to Thailand. And we're actually on well, this question about capital equipment. We're actually right now relocating a factory, closing a factory in China, relocating to Thailand, and we're having to deal with the same scenario of the equipment because we they've got a twenty year old pain line which is not going to be allowed, but they've got plenty of other equipment that is much more recent and is allowed, right? 
So we have to sell that paint line to China, but we'll just bring the other equipment in down into Thailand. Um, so we've got uh, we've got some more questions that popped up. Um, uh, this was around. Um, oh, th there's someone here had a specific question around solar panels, but it applies to others. That there's a, there's a fight going on here in the U.S. about solar panels that are actually coming out of Thailand, but there's a question of whether they are really Chinese, whether it's really a case of transshipment, right? Uh, one from China being relabeled in Thailand and being brought back here. Do you all see, have you all seen recate situations when the government is, is, is trying to, your local government in Thailand and Vietnam is trying to address this whole idea of transshipment of Chinese oh. companies trying to get around the tariff structure using Thailand or Vietnam? There was, um, in 2020, there were some extreme cases with uh, aluminum extrusion coming out of China that was um, being mislabeled and transshipped. And um, there was, uh, I think there were some internal conversations with the, the, the Vietnamese government that said, that basically said, if, uh, if this doesn't stop, we're gonna just assume it's all Chinese. And uh, China and Vietnam made some very aggressive steps to stop that. And since that, it has greatly reduced. I mean, there's there's still issues, but it's nowhere near like what it was looking like was going to happen um, earlier. Interesting. Ben, have you seen that at all in Thailand? Uh, sorry, Alex. What was the, uh, the the question? I just dropped sound for a second there. Sure, sure. It was just talking about the person raising the whole idea of transshipment, right? Going from China into trying to get around the tariffs of their shipping product from China down in Thailand, relabeling and then bringing it into the U.S. And then Jake was talking about doing this on the aluminum, the yeah. source piece of the intrusion. Yeah, so we, we, I mean, I know, Jacob, we, you brought that up when we were talking a little earlier. I, I haven't, I, I am sure it would go on. I, I'm sure that it, it, it must happen in Thailand. I haven't seen it or witnessed it. Um, there, I, I'm so I, I can't comment on on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's fair. Well, look, look we are right at twelve o'clock, um, and and this is a one hour. We're gonna get get uh, I promise, keep it really clear. Uh, so, first of all, um, want to thank everyone for participating on this. Particularly, want to thank Ben Dobbs. Want to thank Jacob Miller. Want to thank Mark Plum uh, for for coming in and providing their expertise. It is late at night in Thailand. It's late at night in Vietnam. Um, and these individuals need to get to bed. Um, so I want to thank them. Appreciate it very much. Again, we will have a recorded session, the recorded and the audio session come forward. There are several questions we didn't get to. I'm going to ask one real quick and then we'll call it. Um, but we'll be forwarding all the answers to the questions to those people who asked them. And because we weren't able to get to all of them. Also, everyone will get a, a recording of the audio and video. Um, the final question that came in, we'll take one, we'll take one more, uh, Ben and Jacob, if you all will indulge us for one final question. Um, the question was around demographics, and the demographics in China, obviously, are showing that labor is going to be an issue, right? The workforce is getting older. Um, there is a concern in China. You know, they've expanded now to have more than one child, but there's a real concern around demographics around the labor force in China. It's getting much getting much older, and what's that going to be like when you've got a facility on the ground in China in, in ten years? Can you talk a little bit about Thailand, a little bit about Vietnam, about about that scenario? Because I think in both of those countries, you're not doesn't look like you're going down. They're not going to have the same issue that China is. No, I, I think especially Vietnam is you know very young country, growing uh, country demographics, um, and it a lot of people coming into the prime spending ages that's why there's so much focus on a lot of retail companies coming in here a lot of distribution coming in here a lot of new brands coming in here because they're going after this huge population that's growing and going to be spending money on consumer goods in china that's it's done um those people are are past that age of spending that money and the population is starting to shrink and so it's a very different situation than Vietnam. Very much so, yeah. Uh, ben, can you comment on that in Thailand as well, if you can? Yeah, it's an interesting one. You know, I think almost for as long as I've been out here, everyone's been asking the question, where are we going to get all this labor from? 
for for the continual you know dramatic growth of of companies and manufacturing companies coming into Thailand year on year, uh, and and we haven't we haven't ever seen a, a shortage, uh, and and that isn't because labor's coming from from Cambodia or, or other parts of the of the region, right? That's that's Thai labor force. Now, uh, I have been in in a few presentations uh, over the past six to twelve months, and I think this is a concern in Thailand now. Uh, Thailand has uh, has got a slightly aging population, nowhere near at the trend and pace of of China, but I do I do start to hear, you know, rumblings that this is something that needs to be uh, to be looked at and addressed. It's not a short-term problem, uh, I think, right. undoubtedly. But uh, but yeah, it's on the radar. Interesting. Interesting. Well, look, again, it's late at night in Thailand, late at night in Vietnam. Thank you all, Ben. Thank you, Jacob, for taking the time to do this. Uh, again, everyone will receive a copy of the recording. Uh, Mark, thank you. And uh, we'll appreciate it. And uh, thank you all for taking the time. So this now concludes you, this Roger. webinar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>